In-depth journalism in the Memphis community, The Daily Memphian is of Memphis, not just in Memphis, and seeks to tell the stories of this city. TheDailyMemphian.com. Truth in place. Introducing St. Jude Flashpoint. We don't get to choose what happens to us, but we do get to choose how we let it affect us. Rate, review, and subscribe to St. Jude Flashpoint. I'm Eric Barnes with The Daily Memphian, and welcome to The Sidebar, a weekly show on arts, culture, and anything in between. Today, we're having a conversation about how nonprofits and community organizations have held up during the pandemic. And to that end, I'm joined by Jared Barnett, Managing Director with Slingshot Memphis. Jared, thanks for being here. Great to be here. Thanks, Eric. Um, give people the, you know, the kind of elevator speech on, on what you are, but we'll, we'll dig a lot deeper into that in the second half of the conversation. Yeah, sounds great. I think the simplest way I put it is slingshots and independent assessor of poverty fighting impact. So we work with nonprofits to assess their poverty fighting effectiveness. We work alongside them to help identify opportunities to enhance that effectiveness. And then we also help invest uh, in those organizations when there's, you know, to amplify their high impact interventions and their oppor- address their opportunities for growth. Uh, and our kind of purpose is to lead kind of a, a movement that transitions more towards outcomes focused, evidence based poverty fighting um, to empower everyone who's trying to fight poverty with greater information and greater insights that make to make more effective decisions. And, and again, we'll talk go deeper and we'll talk about it as we go along, but I, I, I want to get more into the metrics and the how you measure those outcomes. And I mean, it's one of the huge challenges of nonprofit work across the board, but but poverty particularly and, yeah. and the impact that the pandemic has had um, is, you know, we have this odd moment of being in a kind of K-shaped, as people say sometimes, um, recovery, where for many people, um, and I would throw myself in this, I could work from home. I could, our, the Daily Memphian could be a virtual um, company, the YXR, you know, if you're listening to this on the radio station, could pretty easily work virtually and, and make it all work. A lot of people couldn't. And then, and that tended to be people who were on the lower end of the income scale. Um, but even those not working, you know, or who couldn't work as childcare, I mean, just the hit to the lower end has been entirely different than in many cases, a kind of gain in home prices and stock market stuff for the upper end. So what have you seen and what have you seen among organizations you work with in terms of how they've, they've fought through this pandemic and tried to continue to help people? Yeah, I would say that, you know, the, the, there definitely was a big shift last spring towards kind of emergency type services, right? So addressing the immediate needs, so that was food, you know, stable housing, um, you know, necessities of healthcare and things of that nature. So there was a big shift for organizations that we worked with to making sure that that was provided. Um, and then kind of after a couple of months, when we realized that this was going to last a lot longer, uh, then everyone tried to figure out how do we go back to our normal programming, but in a virtual environment. Um, and so it, it's been, uh, for the nonprofits we work with, it's been challenging to figure out how to do that. It's also been challenging for those they work with because they're not always as, um, you know, technically connect, like connected, digitally connected um, as others. And so they're asking them to do things in a way. So a lot of our nonprofits provided tablets and phones and things to those they work with to try and ensure they could stay connected. Um, and I think the the hardest challenge has been twofold, right? One, it's, it's in t- maintaining income during this time frame, um, right? When a lot of these jobs uh, have disappeared or, uh, or evaporated for the time being. And I completely agree with you, Eric, that it, for those that are kind of middle-class and above, it's a very different experience living through the pandemic than for those who you know, are, are experiencing poverty or at risk of experiencing poverty. I just think they've disproportionately felt these, these challenges. Um, and so I think that's a part of it. And then I think the challenges also with school have been a big, big issue here as well. We work with a lot of organizations that provide after school support or in school um, support. And having that all be virtual um, has created, and obviously the challenges of learning and how to do that effectively virtually, but also for the families where they now no longer have someone to you know, supervise and care for their children during the day and are trying to still 
find employment and do employment. And that conflict has been really hard. Um, and so I know like an organization like the Boys and Girls Clubs of Memphis that we work with, uh, you know, being a uh, like a digital hub for learning has been a, a really powerful way for some of those students to get more support, as well as for the parents to still have the opportunity to work without, um, you know, having to, to leave their kids in less than ideal situations. Um, and also, I mean, you think about um, the isolation that so many people have had and the isolation that even, you know, kids in the, in the, you know, the wealthiest of families and with the nicest of laptops might just yep. really not, I mean, feel, you know, the levels of depression and the levels have just been awful uh, nationally, the numbers that have come out with kids, kids and adults, but I just, we're talking about kids feeling yeah, that yeah. sense of isolation. Um, it, 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 how much, I mean, I don't know, it, it, this is a goofy question, but I'll ask it anyway. I mean, how much more has it cost uh, you know, and I'm not asking for a specific number, but just from a financial point of view to do some of the things you, these nor- nonprofits would normally do. Um, I mean, you're talking about them providing digital devices to people in need. That's expensive, yeah. right? You're talking about juggling a lot and PP, PPE and maybe dividers in spaces and distancing and providing masks and that there's costs associated with that just in hard dollars, right? There absolutely is. Um, and it's, uh, obviously, depending on the type of nonprofit, they'll experience greater or less of those. It also depends on how big their program has been impacted and how much they've shifted. So for those that have shifted away from, you know, their normal, quote unquote, um, you know, programming to something that's more specific to the pandemic, that has a whole entire set of costs that go with it from uh, transitioning. And a lot of times funding is very specific around programming. And these nonprofits don't have flexibility to use that for other other purposes. Oh, I hadn't even thought about that. Right. Oh my God. And so it, it exacerbates the, the, the cost challenge because sometimes they can't reallocate funds to other programs um, unless they go through the, which is often a challenging effort of getting, you know, express permission from that particular funder to, to do so. Um, and so, you know, in terms of dollar amount, right, it, it's tough to say, but there's been a huge increase there. The other challenge, a lot of organizations have made investments prior to COVID and, the investments they've made, they can't experience the benefits yet because COVID has messed up the, the what that program was intended to do. And so I, I know there's been a couple of organizations, you know, we, we look, we do help think of a benefit cost ratio with the organizations we work with. And those benefit cost ratios have been impacted because they've made, you know, expenses towards creating certain benefits and then haven't been able to provide those benefits because of COVID. So it's uh, impacted that way in terms of funding too, that Right, right. Um, I, I should say, uh, this is Eric Barnes, and you're listening to The Sidebar on WYXR.org, or as a podcast through The Daily Memphian. Uh, and I'm speaking with Jared Barnett, uh, Managing Director with Slingshot Memphis. Um, the, the, the other thing that um, I, I've got, I just, what well, we know is a challenge, but it's, it's hard to quantify, um, is volunteers. A lot of nonprofits, not all, but a lot rely on volunteers. The volunteer, whether that's a, a literacy group bringing in, you know, tutors to read, or it's cleaning up in Memphis, or it's, you know, mentoring. Um, I would imagine, as you all are so focused on poverty, that there's a certain amount that you do that is, you mentioned Boys and Girls Club, there's just a lot of mentoring. That, yeah. you know, you've got the logistics <laughs> of getting people into a room or a building or a place then you've got the fear and people have been very fearful to, so how, what have you seen there in terms of the, um, again, like maybe a, maybe a, a tutor can do it virtually if the, the, the child or the person or the adult has a, has a device on the other end, but some amount of that just doesn't, you know, it's, we all know Zoom is highly imperfect, right? <laughs> so what, what sort of impact yeah. on, has it had on volunteers with the organizations you work with? Yeah. So, um, I would say that the word that comes to my mind is a lot of creativity has yeah. had to be used on this front, right? I think when when COVID immediately hit, uh, nobody wanted to get in the same room with each other, uh, right? It was just, there was so much uncertainty, so little ways of understanding how to prevent it, um, that at that time, it was really probably the most challenging was in those immediate timeframes afterwards. Uh, that said, there were definitely organizations that were like I'm thinking of organizations like MAM and neighborhood Christian centers that did food distribution events where they were able to reach out to the community, uh, faith-based organizations they work with and others to be able to you know, create enough volunteers to do that. But they were able to very clearly be outside, you know, keep the social distancing. Uh, and, in, and in those environments, it was easier uh, on a relative basis to find volunteers. I think is 
as we've gotten more ingrained in this, organizations have been much more creative around how they try and, and make that happen. Um, and so the virtual piece is definitely one aspect of that that's there. A lot of times they've had to reduce the number of organizations they work with. Uh, Hope House is a good example where you know they provide um, uh, therapy and mental health support, and they've had to reduce the size of those sessions. Um, and therefore, you know they can manage the the people there and create an environment that volunteers and others would be be safe as well as the participants themselves. And so, through a combination, I think of of just reducing the size of of people and and the you know creating more meetings <laughs> versus less, but just having fewer people in them. Uh, there's also been a lot of work on the PPE side that I think has given people a lot of comfort. Um, that was one of the unique things that Slingshot was involved with is we did uh, over $10,000 PPE procurement on our own and then distributed that to a lot of the organizations we work with who needed that kind of support to kind of continue even just their emergency services uh, during the, the initial months there of COVID. Um, and I think a lot of organizations got comfortable. Advanced Memphis is another one that's kind of taken this as an opportunity to do something new. So they now create yeah. uh, face masks uh, as part of what they do, which isn't something before COVID they did, not only to protect their own um, you know, staff and, and beneficiaries, but also you know, provide that as a service for others and, and yeah. helping as well. So uh, one example of the many forms of creativity that have, have come out of this. Right. Um, the other event, or not event, uh, uh, in-person thing that, you know, uh, activity that obviously has been limited and has got to hit nonprofits. I assume the ones you work with really, I know it's hit the arts uh, hard. It's hit all kinds of hard is, is the lack of in-person events, you know, so that yeah. tends to be a big fundraiser, whether that is a big um, white tablecloth banquet, which you and I can maybe talk off the record about how effective those really are, um, <laughs> but, uh, or it's a gathering or it's, you know, it's, it's free beer in the park and, you know, people throwing money in a bucket or, you know, fundraising is obviously a huge part for virtually all nonprofits and in-person fundraising, talking to people, cultivating donors, all that sort of stuff that happens with nonprofits. Um, again, is just really not, I'm sure they've done a lot of zoom, but it's, it's got to have taken a hit or caused a hit. Hundred percent, yeah. It, it is definitely, I think, impacted just about every nonprofit that we've interacted with. Um, some have been able to overcome that in different ways; others have not, and are still struggling with the repercussions that that's had on on their funding and therefore the the servicing they can provide. I think the the way I've seen that kind of influence most is that for again these types of organizations that are providing more emergency type services, they've still been able to maintain funding either through increased public funding because the, you know, the Shelby County and city of Memphis are looking for ways to, you know, provide support on those services um, or just because people more naturally gravitate towards, Hey, we need to help with food. We need to help with these other things. And so those, you know, emergency service type organizations tend to have weathered it better. It's the organizations and the arts is a good example. That I think get further removed from what some people might view as necessity. And again, I know you could go into a whole discussion around whether the arts sure. are a necessity. That I, I, uh, I played in the orchestra, I sang in a choir, so I, I don't want to um, do anything that puts them in a different light. But Jared, why do you hate music so much? Why do you hate music? <laughs> no, I, I know, I but, hear what you're saying. Yeah, but it's been harder there um, because it, I, I, I would say that you know it's easier to overlook. Right, some of these other services that um, you know may not be viewed as top of mind around how do you weather a pandemic or how do you you know maintain someone's um, health or or income, uh, and and that's where I think there's been the biggest challenge. And so they've they've been thoughtful on that. Uh, right. We've tried to support organizations in a proportionate way based on where you know with our limited funding we can contribute, knowing kind of the the different needs and challenges that are there. Uh, but it's still something, Eric, that I would say is a, a big challenge right now. Um, yeah. But, um, let me uh, take a second. I want to come back to some of those things you talked about, but let me take a quick minute here to say that I am Eric Barnes and this is the sidebar, which airs here on WYXR 91.7 FM every Thursday at 1130. You can also get the show at WYXR.org or it is one of many weekly podcasts we do at the Daily Memphian, including the Behind the Headlines podcast, as well as Bill Drees' politics podcast, a number of sports podcasts, and Jennifer Biggs' food podcast, Sound Bites, which also airs here on WYXR every Thursday at 11, right before this show. All of our podcasts are on the WYXR site, they're on the Daily Memphian site, or on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And now a quick message from one of our sponsors. Introducing St. Jude Flashpoint. We don't get to choose what happens to us, but we do get to choose how we let it affect us. 
Rate, review, and subscribe to St. Jude Flashpoint. I am here with uh, Jared Barnett from Slingshot Memphis. I, you know, one thing you just talked about, and, and I'm going to say this in a way that this might come across as come a, be a bad analogy and might even be flippant, but I'm going to say it anyway. You, you talked about music and, you know, and, and the arts. And I, I, we had Kevin Dean from Momentum Partners talk, having a similar conversation last week as we kind of look at nonprofits, where they've been and where they're going. And I said to him then, you know, I, I love music. I go into live shows, a huge thing. I'm a huge Radiohead fan. Early in this, you know, pandemic, Radiohead put all these uh, never before seen concerts, HD, great sound on their site. I kind of watched part of one, but I, 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 for a number of reasons that I want to segue into what you, the more important work you're doing, not my, you know, missing Radiohead, which is important to me, but is not important in the grand scheme. Um, one, you know, just, it almost reminded me of, of what I was losing, right? That I couldn't go see a concert in person to watch one on HD. The other was I, I was distracted. And, you know, there's a lot of, of surveys out that people aren't watching sports. I mean, most, um, most professional leagues, college leagues, which is kind of professional, um, are all <laughs> down about 50%. I mean, that's across the board, you know, that yeah. hockey, everything, the Kentucky Derby. I mean, it's just, we see it on the traffic on the site on the Daily Memphian, that there's not as much interest. There's a lot of interest, but there's not near as much as there was. And there's all kinds of theories around that. Is that, to a more important point about fighting poverty, do you find that many people just are so in their own bubble and, and perfectly deservedly focused on, you know, homeschooling their kids or helping their kids at home, focused on, you know, the separation from family, feeling the kind of depression of, of whatever degree that we've talked about, feeling the isolation. Um, does that also just cause people to forget about these nonprofits, these community organizations and the important work they do? Yeah, it- so perhaps I think um, is the answer, but I do think that maybe less than, than forget, it's more of just there's other priorities that now consume so much more of their time. And so when you think about, you know, do I volunteer with this nonprofit or do I, you know, think about investing in them at a, you know, at a given point in time, there's a lot of, of distractions, I would say, and, and things that just supersede what you, you know, what their previous kind of prioritization of things was. And so I think it's taken people time to adjust for that. Uh, that said, I have still seen a lot from the philanthropic community here in Memphis uh, being done. Um, I've seen other environments and we've actually done research around what happened to the, you know, uh, philanthropy and poverty fighting back in 2008 and 2009. And that was a bloodbath. Like there was no way to, I mean, it was 40, 50% cuts in funding across the board. And anecdotally, we have not seen that same thing happen here in Memphis. We've still seen a lot of our larger uh, philanthropists, uh, the foundations and others still contributing meaningful amounts of money and, and making sure that, uh, you know, the, the important work that these nonprofit organizations are doing to help, you know, those in our community are, are still being done. So, um, it's it's been inspiring in a way for me to see that it hasn't fallen off the board like it could have. Uh, but that being said, it definitely is being impacted, and much more so for people like me who would, you know, I don't have tens of hundreds of thousands of dollars to invest in in organizations, um, and so for people like me where I'm juggling now, my kids are at home, or I've got to do more of this or that. It's been harder, I think, for for people like like me and others to make sure that stays top of mind. Um, yeah. And I think a, a big part of that is how do, you know, how do we and how, as a community and how do these organizations that, um, that are helping our community keep that top of mind so that, you know, I think people still have the desire. I think a lot of people still have the means, um, but, you know, we, we bump it up in the prioritization and, and not let it get buried by all the other things that COVID has thrown on our plates. Um, uh, Segwaying a little bit into what we talked at the top briefly about what Slingshot does, but you talked about working with organizations, helping them. My my bad uh, paraphrasing of your articulate uh, definition, you know, helping them be more data driven, more outcome based, and that. And we had the same. I had a similar conversation with Kevin Dean last week, talking about, and we won't name names at this point. Second half of the show, um, you know there are so many incredible nonprofits just in, in, around the world, but just in Memphis, that do amazing work. Um, there is unfortunately um, sometimes a, 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 a culture in nonprofits of, um, of having an incredible mission of having incredible people who want to fulfill that mission and help people. 
and having no real financial plan and no business or operational plan, that's a, that's a real challenge. And then there's also, there's the sometimes secondary challenge of having a great business plan, having a great financial, you know, plan, but not really measuring the outcomes. I mean, I, I was on the board of a, of a local nonprofit many, many years ago. I won't name which one. And one a board, and I got on the board and it, it, the mission was great. But the work it did when and a board member pressed and pressed on this question of how many people are we really touching every year? And when that number re- came back and it was in the low hundreds, not relative to a need that was in the tens, if not hundreds of thousands, there was a very quiet moment in the boardroom where people went, oh, wait, what are we doing? We're only touching hundreds of people a year. And that's wonderful that what we did for them or the staff did, I didn't do anything. Um, but it, was, it wasn't an outcome driven or data driven organization. So you all try, am I fair, are those kind of fair points that what you're trying to address? And again, I don't mean to disparage any nonprofit with a great mission and good people, but it is a, it can be a problem in the nonprofit space. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say that there's a lot of challenges in the nonprofit space in a structural way, right? There's a lot of incentives in the for-profit space to measure things and figure out, you know, because at the end of the day, in a for-profit business, you're making profit, you're making money. Everyone's aligned on on what you're trying to do. And there's all sorts of metrics to measure, you know, profit, revenue, market share, return on investment, you know, the list goes on. I've, I've got a finance background, so we could talk about that for a while offline if you want to. But in poverty fighting, there hasn't been that same set of metrics, that same common alignment around, you know, what do we measure to ensure that what we do is having the outcomes that we desire. And so there's absolutely environments where there's great missions and not the right um, infrastructure or, or, you know, skill sets in place to execute and vice versa. Um, I think for us, what we're trying to do is take any of those organizations and help them be more effective. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it, for us, it matters less where you start. It matters more what you do when you have new information that can help empower you. And, and do you choose to make the most of that? Uh, and so, you know, we, we approach that in different ways. I kind of think of it in kind of, of outcomes and, and capabilities. So, uh, you know, we look at like a benefit cost ratio. We, we, would be, we would monetize the benefits that an organization creates. And then we compare that to the cost it takes to produce those benefits and come up with a poverty fighting, you know, return on investment in essence. Uh, and so that's a very concrete way of kind of having some numerical ways of understanding, like, you know, are we producing $1.5 um, worth of value in benefits for every dollar we spend? Or are we, you know, providing 0.75? Um, you know, it's very easy to go with, but we also look at something like systems level change. So how are they impacting the community more broadly outside of just the programming that they do? Uh, and then we look at two things that we kind of consider as crucial to leading to effective poverty fighting, which is em- the employment of best practices, uh, you know, that are research-based, have evidence that they work, as well as a measurement infrastructure uh, or a, a data system that allows you to measure things and use that information to make better decisions. So kind of creating your own feedback loop of, we tried this, here's what it did. We liked or didn't like what that did. Here's how we might change that. We implement that and it creates this cycle. And so that allows any organization to benefit, um, you know, having that kind of information. And our hope is that we create this movement where we have some standard ways of, of measuring things. And, uh, you know, one common way that that's done is what, a term that we would call outputs, which is really around like the number of people that experience something. Uh, and we, the more people you work with, uh, you know, obviously the more experience benefits. But one of the in- unintuitive things about poverty fighting that's come out in the research is that dosage often matters more than the number of people you work with. So for instance, if you're trying to change someone's life, they need a certain amount of programming or a certain amount of um, support to really change where they're at. Um, and sometimes there is a trade-off that makes sense of working with less people, but working with the people you do work with more so that they experience the life-changing benefits that you want them to have. A, a great example is saying like, you know, hey, I want to be in shape. So I'm going to exercise once every six months. And I might be able to get everyone to exercise once every six months, but that right. may not change their their you know their health. Where if I can get someone to exercise daily, right? That will improve their health much more than, than that. And right. so it's an unintuitive thing that 
that's there. And, and our hope is that as we look more around the benefits that are being created, you can make a better decision around, well, how much benefit do we need to provide this person to experience the, the change that we want them to experience and that the benefits that they can receive so that we can be more thoughtful in how we allocate our resources. So, and, uh, I'm sorry, but in what, and what has the reception been? Y'all, y'all have been in Memphis for what now? Two years, almost three years, 2018? Or I'm, so I'm, we, we started in late 2016 16, um, okay. and, and started working with our first organizations in 2017. Okay, I wasn't too far off. So in the reception, again, we're not naming names. I mean, the reception, have you had any pushback from people who say, look, we do what we do. We help people, we change their lives. I don't have time for all this, these outputs in the, in the, 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 the that kind of methodology. Or is it, you know, I guess there's, there's always one outlier. There's always somebody who says that, but what has the reception been? Yeah, so I would say that the reception has been when we're able to demonstrate the evidence and help them see it in a way that, that connects with them. Um, the vast majority of organizations we work with embrace that and, and they don't see it as a, you know, as a, a judgment of who they are or what they are, but they see it as an opportunity to better accomplish their mission and what they want to do. Um, there are some organizations that, you know, would value us more for our funding um, than perhaps for the work we do around, you know, assessing poverty fighting effectiveness and trying to help them think about ways to enhance that. Uh, but I think as a whole, we've just surveyed our partners, actually. We try and do that every year to understand what was it like working with us and, and how are we being effective or not effective for ourselves. Yeah. And the overall response is that our, our work is valued. It's helped them make decisions that they wouldn't have made otherwise that you know, have positive poverty fighting implications. Uh, and you know, we're uh, excited to scale that pretty dramatically here over the next three to five years so that how it's many- much more of a movement versus a... Um, you know, a, and a, a smaller hand, you know, it's about 30 organizations we work with right now. Okay. That's what I was going to say. And the scaling would be reaching how many organizations? Yeah. So our aspiration is to double or triple by the end of 2022. Um, and, and we may go beyond that too, um, as well. Yeah. But really the, the thing in my mind is we want to work with organizations across the, we call it the poverty fighting ecosystem uh, in the areas that disproportionately impact poverty in Memphis. So some of the things that you know are influencing poverty in Memphis will be different than you know in San Francisco or Minneapolis or other parts of the U.S. And so our, it's really important that we focus that on what's unique here in Memphis that's you know contributing to poverty and and contributing to persisting poverty in our city. Um, and you came, you mentioned coming this from a finance background. How, how did you get into this work briefly? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, a really interesting story. So I, I had no aspirations in my life to work in the nonprofit space. It was not, you know, I, I, I've always wanted to have an impact on what I do, but it just, it, it wasn't there. I worked in uh, management consulting with a company called McKinsey and Company for several years uh, and finally got to a point where the trade-offs you have to make with that kind of lifestyle uh, weren't as, as valuable it's as a, they used to be. I know some people who've worked at McKinsey. It's a brutal lifestyle. It's brutal. Yeah. It's uh, and it gets harder as you get more senior because there's just a lot yeah. more you got to do. And so my, I've got kids. I've got five kids. My oldest is 13 now. And so as, five. as you only older, have five kids. Come on, what have you been only doing? Only five. Uh, my wife might want more. We'll we'll see about that one. But <laughs> I'll save you from God that bless, conversation. God bless Eric. you all. <laughs> uh, so yeah, Go so ahead, that was sorry. part of it. And uh, I wanted to do something that had more of an impact on the people I worked with. So um, I, I spent three years working in Africa, and a big part of that was because of the opportunities in a developing country to like do things that more tangibly influence the people that, uh, you know, you get to work with and your customers and all of that. Uh, and so as I looked at kind of shifting my career and doing something that was more personally rewarding, um, I actually found Slingshot through McKinsey. One of our board members, Tom Lakovic, as uh, a current senior partner at McKinsey and um, came across Slingshot. Their, their approach to fighting poverty around this evidence-based outcomes-driven approach resonates with a lot of the work I've done, which is very analytical and yeah. Um, you know, and, and impact based uh, and, you know, started doing a little bit of consulting work with Slingshot, then started working in this role and have just loved it. It's It's yeah. been really rewarding. The team I get to work with are just, it's amazing to be surrounded by people who are talented. Um, and I've been surrounded by a lot of that in my career, but also share right. common values, want to create something together that, you know, is is beyond what we would benefit from just by ourselves, but it creates this greater good. It's just it's awesome to be a part of. All right. Well, we, thank you. Oh, we, this is Jared Barnett from uh, uh, Slingshot Memphis that we've been talking to. Real quickly, because I've done this with almost every guest, what was your first concert? 
first concert, it, this is funny, it was Britney Spears at a county fair bef before she had made it big. <sighs> nice, that is good. You are the second guest who was a Britney Spears. There was another Britney Spears, and I can't remember who it was, but someday I'll, I'll aggregate all these. I'm out of time. <laughs> Thank you uh, for joining us. And again, a reminder that the Sidebar airs on WYXR 91.7 every Thursday at 1130. If you missed any of the show today, you can get the full podcast on the Daily Memphian or the WYXR.org website or wherever you get your podcast. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week. In-depth journalism in the Memphis community, The Daily Memphian is of Memphis, not just in Memphis, and seeks to tell the stories of this city. TheDailyMemphian.com. Truth in place.